and welcome back. In this next panel, we're going to continue our focus, of course, on the engineering and construction industry, but looking now between skyscraping and the shifting sands. So we're really in for a real treat. I'm very, very interested in this topic and this uh, panel that we're about to start. And of course, for all the project management professionals out there, you can earn one PDU for this session. So make sure you pay great attention and check out and claim that code. It'll be in the chat box just as we progress through this. And um, do listen carefully and make sure you get those questions in. We really have a tremendous lineup and I'm really looking forward to be able to engage with them afterwards in a bit of Q&A and make sure that we get your questions into it as well. From the Ministry of Transport in Saudi Arabia, we're delighted to have with us for the panel, the Deputy Minister for Planning and Information, His Excellency, Dr. Mansour Al-Turki. We're also happy to have with us uh, Isha Khaled Al-Ali. He is, of course, a senior professional, an experienced infrastructure and real estate professional with the mega projects and futuristic initiatives. And I'm also delighted to have from the Project Management Institute, the Global Head of Construction and Managing Director for Asia Pacific, Ben Breen is going to join us. So that's our great panel. And um, we're going to have our dear moderator on this one, the Managing Director of the Project Management Institute in Mine, Grace Najjar joins us. So I'm going to hand over now to Grace and we're really looking forward to this panel. I'll be back with you shortly. Grace. Thank you, Etna. I would like to welcome you all to our today's session, the engineering and construction industry between skyscraping and the shifting sands. Being future ready is now a pressing issue, especially following the aftermath of the pandemic that has affected the engineering and construction industry in many ways. As we all know, many construction projects stopped or were delayed. But the challenges of this industry faces are not new. There has been ongoing labor shortages, flat productivity levels, rising material costs and fragmented supply chains, as well as various high profile mega project failures. But these very reasons have been the catalyst in making this industry ripe for disruption, where new trends are emerging and shaking it up, such as sustainability in both the construction process and the finished structure, digitization and technology, infrastructure upgrade and smart city initiatives. Today, leading engineering and construction companies are investing effectively in technology, in people and in project culture to become more future ready. The level of maturity in the organization is determined by their commitment to change, their ability to adapt and implement cutting edge processes innovate with new technologies and optimize human performance, as well as consistently applying fit for purpose management practices, processes and controls to monitor effectiveness in terms of project outcome, all of which have direct impact on the value and return on investment ROI. As the pace of disruption accelerates, pioneering companies are learning how to pilot project and fail fast. Investing in innovation, such as using automated controls, monitored via dashboard on a real-time basis to replace old school project manuals. They are learning how to become agile in responding to evolving conditions and risks based upon accurate real-time reporting, which are promising to make delays and cost overrun a thing of the past. Cutting edge technologies are on the rise, such as the use of drones, sensors, robotics, machine learning, AR, AR and VR. For instance, AR and VR are helping departments of building companies collaborate more efficiently and making project management more relevant than ever before. AR and VR allow construction companies to easily make adjustments and demonstrate them to stakeholders before implementing them and reduce unclaimed projects delivery. Moreover, they help workers stay safe by modeling real time situation through which workers can learn how to behave in a complex environment and in case of emergencies. 3D concrete printing market will grow up to 56.4 million by 2021. 
This is be because it requires fewer costs, it's less time consuming with less workforce needed and has a reduced carbon footprint. Green building trends and sustainability in construction are also on the rise. However, all of these innovative technologies are associated with sometimes the risks and challenges in terms of successful implementation, such as hiring skilled workers to deal with such modern technology and highly qualified workers. This is the need for upskilling and training to transition to the leadership of the next generation. Building a digital roadmap will help companies mitigate some of these challenges. Having said that, and without further ado, I would like now to start our collaborative dialogue about the pressing issues facing the engineering and construction industry from the Middle East and North Africa market. Allow me now to welcome our esteemed panelist, His Excellency Dr. Mansoura Turki, Deputy Minister for Planning and Information and the Executive Director of the Vision Realization Office at the Ministry of Transport, Saudi Arabia, Engineer Isa Khalid Al Ali, Senior Professional Experience in Infrastructure Real Estate, Mega Project, and Futuristic Initiatives, and last but not least, my colleague Ben Breen, the Global Head of Construction and PMI Asia Pacific MD. Ben, I will start the discussion with you first to give us an overview from a global perspective on the current situation of the construction industry. In your opinion, what are the current challenges the industry faces, especially in responses to the new normal? Thank you, Grace. It's uh, absolutely my pleasure to be here today in the, uh, the Big Five Digital Festival. Uh, so, yes, your, your introduction is great. There is you know, so many challenges going on uh, in the world and, and particularly in, in construction. And you also mentioned that um, this is not new. There, there has always been some disruption going on in construction and certainly you know, the world has changed significantly over the years, um, perhaps more so in the last 12 months. But prior to that, technology was having a major impact um, in disrupting uh, you know, the world and disrupting construction industry in particular. And I, I think uh, it's interesting because technology grows so quickly and yet people and organisations are a lot slower to follow on um, because of maybe time or cost constraints or when you're talking about organizations, they are perhaps very hierarchical and just not working in an agile manner. So it's very difficult to try and keep up with, with the latest technological change. And the fact is COVID-19 has already had a big impact and will continue to do so. So things like a much stricter you know, regulation on, on the work site, um, looking at sustainability and safety and, and things like that will be very important. Uh, you can see as well that capital funding is potentially going to be an issue, um, although you could argue that with government projects, they're going to be spending quite a lot of money on infrastructure that is needed to sort of stimulate the, the economy. Um, and that's usually around infrastructure and healthcare at the moment. So those are the things that are going to immediately change due to, to COVID. Um, there's one thing that I think will be good from this, and, and that is the fact that we will need to be a lot more efficient in everything that we do. We will need to you know, upskill our staff and, and make sure that they're sort of multidisciplined because you'll have less people doing the same amount of work. So you've got to be more skillful and understand across different verticals of, um, of skill sets. And I think it's important as well with technology to use it to help you not to hinder and it, it can actually hinder if it's not used in the right way and it's certainly only as good as the people that are using it and if you look at some of the studies done by companies like McKinsey they will say that technology will displace up to 800 million people in the next 10 years uh, and that's just an incredible number and those people can't retire you know they have mouths to feed and uh, they will need to be retrained and, and reskilled and Again, I think that's a good thing. I think that people will be the key to really getting through this, this volatility that's going on in the world. Um, and if you look at a couple of other issues in terms of, I, I think there's things like housing afford, affordability that will really be a significant 
uh, changer in the world. It, it's something that's so uh, such a key element. You know, I think about one third of global urban households can't even afford a decent place of living. Um, the market prices are just too high, and this will become worse with you know, younger generations and the, the youth, the average age is, is a lot younger now with countries like India and Africa. Um, and there's also going to be a real scarcity of skilled labour. So retirements will have an impact on that. If you look at the US construction workforce alone, I think 41% of them are expected to retire in the next 10 to 15 years. So yeah, that will have a very big impact. Um, and I think lastly, the other thing that will change quite a lot is things like materials. Uh, there will be a lot, a lot of new innovations in materials. Um, let's look at things like cement, where there are a lot of different R&D going on to determine the right kinds of cement. Can you make it more lightweight and stronger? You know, can you enable a, a reduction of a carbon footprint, which is a, a very large issue as well? Um, you should be looking at different alternative materials like cross laminated timber um, and getting it from sustainable sources as well. So sustainability keeps popping up again and again. Uh, I think the logistics will change significantly. So there'll be a, a bigger centralization, uh, a lot more offsite fabrication, and then uh, you know sending them from far and wide locations to, to get to where they need to be. Um, so there is a lot of changes. There is a, a, a lot of um, risks, but I think there are also opportunities. And as I mentioned, I think the key thing for me is having the right people with the right mindset, the right skills to navigate through a very complex world and, and um, you know, push through so that we can be even more successful. Thank you, Ben. Very insightful inputs on the challenges of the industry. Uh, Saudi Arabia has invested in one of the most advanced and diverse construction portfolios in the world supporting Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. These portfolios, along with the supporting mega projects, are complex by nature and must face many challenges. Dr. Turki, may you walk us through some of the challenges Saudi Arabia faces and how it managed to turn them into great opportunities? Oh, sure. That's a, that's a good question. Indeed, Saudi Arabia has invested tremendously in infrastructure portfolios. Uh, that's basically to achieve Vision 2030 ambitious goals. Uh, the challenges Saudi Arabia, and I believe also the globe, is facing uh, are definitely relevant to, uh, in summary, a timely acquiring required resources to execute. Uh, when it comes to resources, first of all, financial resources and stable cash flows uh, for all portfolios will be a challenge, especially after the pandemic, which we are uh, mitigating by exploring funding of alternatives, vehicles, and attracting private sector participation. In addition, required skilled human resources to manage some of the projects are nationally uh, uh, scarce, um, uh, which we are trying to rapidly bridge uh, this gap by launching national programs uh, to enable project management offices to have best international practices uh, and providing um, uh, uh, best practices also in terms of guidelines and training. Also ensuring um, uh, the international uh, renowned project management companies are executing and able to execute complex mega projects uh, as there, um, uh, while also ensuring a proper and firm knowledge transfer plans for young Saudi professionals. But I would definitely end up with one of the key challenges also uh, that Saudi Arabia is facing, which is highly relevant to supplying materials and equipment. Uh, uh, this is something that have been heavily acquired uh, to execute construction portfolios and had definitely introduced enough viability to localize industries and services related to uh, cons uh, construction. Uh, this will definitely support the kingdom goals uh, to diversify the economy and increase non-oil GDP as well. Uh, these are the uh, probably key elements, uh, as I stated in the beginning, uh, I think, and I believe uh, from my daily practice, that uh, a key challenge uh, Saudi Arabia is facing nowadays is how to timely acquire uh, resources. And, and I think these resources 
can uh, rightly be cascaded into, you know, financial human capital resources, and eventually also uh, uh, material supply uh, and equipment availability. Thank you, Dr. Mansour, for these useful uh, inputs. The UAE has long been among the most active and forward-looking construction markets in the world. From skyscrapers such as Burj Khalifa to the Mega Expo 2020 constructions to, ar to architectural edifices such as the Louvre's Museum, as well as the Museum of the Future and MBR City District 1. In your opinion, Engineer Isa, what are the main factors that enable the UAE to excel in the construction industry? And moving forward, will the UAE in the post pandemic pursue its competitiveness in this sector? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. First, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I think my fellow panelists already added a very high uh, insightful information about the current situation and the future. Uh, back to your question about the UAE. Uh, UAE and Dubai is a very special uh, case in construction revolution in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, Dubai, for example, has been a living lab for a future city. Uh, all the innovative ideas, the skyscraper, the largest man-made island, have uh, been uh, done in Dubai. And it's not done only by the skill set that we have here but because we have invited uh, innovative and uh, creative uh, mindsets from abroad, from being from the United States, Europe, uh, elsewhere. Uh, that, because we have a very uh, agile government mentality, the competitiveness, it, it invited large scale contractors and uh, big uh, capacity uh, consultants, big force, project managers, systems, along with very strong, I would say, uh, stakeholders, such as the municipalities, the road and transport authorities, water and electricity authority, those are stakeholders are very important for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, unusual type of uh, projects and innovative ones. Sometimes you might be uh, constrained by existing standards and regulations uh, or code of, uh, of building, but to do those ones, you need a different kind of standards to be, uh, I mean, uh, in place for those ones. For example, Burj Khalifa, if you look at it, uh, before 2005, the construction code did not understand that high-rise building and neither civil defense. But all the stakeholders came together, the consultant, the contractor, and even the concrete ready mix contractor had to come up with a mix that is suitable within two hours to reach that I would say 500 uh, meter above the ground, uh, never experienced. And it has to pass the slump test and all the engineering tests and reach there. The civil defense, for example, would care about somebody staying in the level 135 or 140 and can evacuate within the allowed time. And going with the normal standards of evacuation, that wouldn't work. So to do that, it's not only the uh, the innovation or the uh, capabilities of industry but you need also a very strong government and supportive stakeholders around those kind of, of projects above all i would say the spirit of success and the culture of modernization was driving everything so moving forward now people might say that it has reached to a level of saturation or a level of of, of at the top and then there are surrounding uh, uh, cities or countries that will challenge or uh, compete against uh, UAE. That's, an, I think, very good, actually, because it will build that kind of uh, competitive and success. But those who came first will have a better advantage. So the, the pandemic, I think it was like a, a stop in a race. We were in a very uh, fast forward uh, race. It gives you a relief to breathe and correct whatever uh, we have missed. Uh, we were definitely, the people here will go back to their register, uh, risk registers and have the pandemic as an added. It was not there in, in the railway or, or uh, bigger projects that we had. We were looking at risks that are kind of expected or known type of risk, maybe with lower probabilities, but unforeseen risk like this one was not there. So how to deal with it was, I mean, 
kind of uh, challenging, yet 70% are other kind of risk mitigation apply there. So this will definitely change the game. It will uh, bring alert to those who had, I mean, very old type of contracts and supply chain. It has to be more efficient, as Ben has said earlier. Uh, the contract method and subcontractor relationship will definitely change. For example, uh, Aldar in Abu Dhabi already started to apply an escrow account to manage all the way all the suppliers and subcontractors so that the money cannot be controlled by a giant contractor, but it's, it's controlled by the client who is managing his, his phasing. Now, going forward, there might be a new phasing strategy and more efficient delivery of, of projects. So I think, and I'm sure that the investors have seen the response that we have, the agility of government and resilience in our system. Definitely bigger investors' uh, money would come again in the coming uh, year or so. And post-Expo, I think it will flourish again and go back even higher than how it was. Thank you, Engineer Raisa, very helpful feedback. Ben, back to you. As mentioned, talent is at the heart of the construction sector. May you please share with us some insights on the disruptive trends and new skills required in the near future to face the challenges and pain points discussed? Sure, Grace. Um, I, I think a very important thing here is that uh, PMI every year does a survey um, it's called the pulse of the profession, and that goes out to thousands of our members and, and our partners as well. So this year we wanted to focus on the companies who were being um, very successful during this crisis and they were thriving rather than being left behind. And uh, the survey went out and, and it came back with three very clear skills. And we, we're saying the three tenets that, uh, that we believe others should follow. Uh, and the first one is that ability is agility. So in other words, the company has to be very agile. There is no doubt about that now. Um, organizations that can move ahead quickly and fail fast and then pivot and, and get on the right path as quickly as they can are really strongly positioned for the future. And the second one is that technology rules, but people influence. So again, it's, it's what I was mentioning before about technology can, can be wonderful and it can be taking you in what you think is the right direction. And then something like COVID or, or another technology comes around and just fundamentally changes everything and turns it on its head. Um, so I think, again, it's about the influence that people can have and making sure that as companies and as individuals, we're investing in the people and the, and the skills that the people have. And the third one that came back was that it's a, it's a project leader's world. So you have to have the right skills to, um, to push ahead. You have to have the technical skills and, and the methods and tools. But at the same time, if you don't have people skills, you're not going to be a leader. And we need more leaders in this difficult time as well. So if you're making the vision clear, others will buy into that vision and they will follow you. And I've worked with many project managers, unfortunately, that just, that on paper, they're the most skilled, they have the best experience, but if they don't know how to communicate well, they don't know how to get others to, to follow them or you know, to lead them in the right direction, then they're not going to be useful at all. Uh, and the only other thing I, I wanted to add there was soft skills, traditional soft skills, like empathy and, and communication um, critical thinking, data analytics, and, and even maths is important. I, I keep telling this to my children. Yes, maths will be useful. Um, it's becoming more and more important in, in analyzing data and, and determining what we can do with that data. And the, I think if you look at the World Economic Forum, the top 10 skills are mostly related to people skills. You know, how, how do you communicate? How do you do all of these things? And PMI is now calling them the power skills instead of the soft skills because it's more relevant. These are the skills that are, are going to power the future generations. Thank you, Ben. Given the fact we are heading towards the new normal, Your Excellency, Dr. At Turkey, may you please talk about how Saudi Arabia is planning and preparing for a better future to stay on the world map 
as a leading country? Sure. Uh, I believe planning for construction projects uh, will be done differently. Uh, not only, to be honest, in Saudi Arabia, but also uh, internationally and globally. Uh, the pandemic, I believe, uh, might have permanently changed the way uh, we look to risk assessment. Uh, it used to be a topic that we, uh, you know, deal with as a given, as something we need to complete. But truly speaking, the pandemic uh, gave us the opportunity to revisit that specific chapter again and, and examine it in a different way uh, with more uh, serious look, uh, if I may describe. Uh, there are events that are now probable and, and contingencies that we need to account for. Uh, and, and, and we need to account for with mitigation measures that are solid, at least in the near future. Um, in addition, updated uh, project uh, health and safety guidelines and procedures uh, is definitely another key element. This is due to the updated uh, situation, and this is important to come up with the requirements that ensure safety and health uh, uh, to the project personnel during the pandemic without the need to entirely suspend the work as well. We know that we are committed to a specific deadlines. Uh, a lot of projects are actually associated with challenging uh, time frames and deadlines and uh, delivery is something that it's in, in many cases not tolerable. Uh, we need to deliver, uh, uh, but we also need to ensure that there's a proper guidelines and procedures when it comes to health and safety. Uh, this is another topic that I, I put in line and next to the uh, risk assessment as well uh, that the pandemic also gave us an opportunity to look at and revisit and think about it twice. Uh, moreover, I think the required transformational projects to enable entities uh, to deploy technologies uh, such as the artificial intelligence and internet of things are green fields and uh, in nature and require different type of planning and project management approaches. Uh, agile execution, this is one of the things that also uh, PMI is highly considering recently, um, is definitely something uh, we need to consider rather than waterfall project execution. Uh, and partnership rather than a client-vendor relationship. Uh, these are the elements that will be highly beneficial to, uh, to expedite these kind of transformational projects and transformational uh, moves. Um, I will end up with the fact that also prioritizing uh, a project portfolio uh, and preparing different cash flow scenarios um, have definitely shown its value over the years. Uh, uh, this is something of importance, it's highly relevant to the planning phase uh, more than the other phases in my opinion and it needs to has its own uh, dedicated time and effort in order to come up with a proper prioritized listed of uh, uh, of projects within that specific portfolio and it's definitely uh, shown the value uh, and more precisely during this pandemic uh, era uh, now you can tell how important is it if, if you have done your work when it comes to prioritizing your list of, of projects within a specific portfolio. And I believe this will be also taken more thoroughly during the initiation phase of, of, future, of future projects. Uh, and in a nutshell, um, the pandemic, in my opinion, and I always say that to my colleagues and, and uh, co-workers, this is something that gave us really uh, an opportunity uh, and instead of looking at it as a constraint. Uh, and when it comes to project management, planning phase, challenges, uh, uh, or even back to the question where you say how we are planning for the, uh, for the new normal, uh, I think the pandemic came in a time uh, where we can really revisit these kind of elements, uh, essential uh, essential chapters and, and, 
and uh, tools that we need to utilize and think about more deeply. Uh, it used to be givens, in my opinion, that we deal with, with uh, you know, with the uh, thoughts in, in the back of our heads that this is not really happening. However, we need to list it for one new reason or another. However, nowadays it's it's really happening. It's there. It's actual. It's reality. So that's why I look at it as an opportunity. And I think um, uh, these are the elements that we need to really focus on uh, to ensure a proper delivery uh, while also ensuring proper project management. Thank you so much. So you agree with me, we can even call it the better normal, not only the new normal. Exactly. Thank you exactly. so much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Dr. Turki. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. The engineering profession has always been challenging the status quo and rethinking the ways engineers are working, leading, and addressing the pain points. But now, new aspects are emerging and innovation is, is disrupting how engineers deliver effectively. Engineer Aisa, what's your own experience and real examples on these emerging needs of skilling and upskilling? Uh, if we quickly look at the landscape of construction in UAE in the past, I would say 15 to 20 years, there have been, I mean, uh, a larger, I mean, uh, growth in, in, in achieving with human uh, capabilities. Engineers have been able to fight against, uh, uh, I mean, uh, water challenges, and we've, we've made uh, multiple man-made islands, such as the World Island, the Palm Island, Three Palm Islands, those are unparalleled elsewhere, and I think the human being reached uh, a new level of, of building, uh, unnormal buildings in the water. Uh, if you look at the skyscrapers, also humans reach to a higher level by engineering mindsets and challenges. Looking at the driverless metro in Dubai, for example, it's the largest uh, network of driverless uh, metro network. Look at uh, the canal. The, it was a dream for, for our leaders. Uh, in Dubai for the past more, I think 20 or 30 years to connect the creek all back again uh, to the sea. It took several phases and there was an engineering challenge that the water can move or not move. You don't want the stagnation. You don't want other environmental and uh, aquamarine challenges, but human and engineers have done that, the, uh, that difficult part. It went now to a higher level. Now, many things are, are, are done as engineering challenges, but going post-pandemic, post-COVID, uh, there are new challenges that we have to respond to. We have done the impossible possible, but now we need to make people live, I mean, uh, a more enjoyable uh, uh, life. So it will go to a level, uh, for example, I would say in the railway, we were thinking about, you know, sand mitigation, uh, our railway network goes in the desert, very uh, high level. Nobody, uh, I mean, experienced having a network above 70 or 80 meters of, uh, of sand dunes. So that was an engineering challenge. But thinking forward, we want when people have a passenger train going at that uh, in the desert to don't, uh, not have a disconnectivity with internet. So we have, there are cables of uh, infra uh, telecommunication infrastructure under the underground, under the network everywhere. Uh, if we f uh, th think about Expo, for example, 2015, we were thinking about the future of experience of those people who are going to visit and enjoy the, uh, the experience of Expo event. And not just a very good uh, community, but you want a more luxurious, you want the data to be available to human instantly, the traffic the motion to be controlled, people experience to be enjoyable. So those it requires infrastructure that supports that. Today we, we see people scanning our bodies with those guns to temperature control. I'm sure that next year those scanning devices for human uh, conditions will become like those uh, we plug in the building for the safety of the building or smoke detectors. So engineers will be smarter to think about not engineering challenges, but to respond more about uh, more quality of life, quality of journey uh, to human, to the supply chain. If we look at the labor, for example, uh, it needs to be more efficient living camps for, for them. You have to have uh, ca capabilities to distribute food, I would say, to that level to, to workers 
with ticketing system instead of queuing uh, during the pandemic was a trend. So those need to be educated. Overall system, I would say, need to be smarter, invest in technology for sure, anywhere possible, and more efficient way of um, development and maintaining a life cycle and a benefit realization of the ultimate uh, communities that we build. Thank you, Aisa, amazing feedback. Uh, my last question to you, Ben. Uh, following all what has been discussed so far, and as PMI is now getting more relevant and closer to the market and industries, how are we contributing to the con construction industry? And what are PMI's latest offering for the construction sector in building the relevant skills needed? Yeah, thanks, Grace. Um, this is certainly something I'm very passionate about. And uh, we identified in PMI a need for a course focused on construction. We feedback that the PMP is wonderful, but we need something specialised in construction that really helps to address the pain points. And the pain points are very common all around the world. It's an industry that has a lot of waste, and if you put it in dollar terms, for every billion dollars spent, there's $127 million wasted. Incredible numbers. Um, you know, nine out of 10 projects, mega projects, finish late and end up in dispute. You know, profit margins are shrinking. There's no common terminology used all around the world. So there's all these things that were identified, again, with some pretty major surveys and speaking to our partners. So we've put together a really strong team. Saudi Aramco has been one of the main drivers of, of putting this together with us as well. Uh, um, there's others like BHP and, and Larson and Tabro, DPR, US Army, Department of Energy, um, and CII and LCI as two other institutes working with us. And essentially we're listening to our partners, we're facilitating the development of a construction certification and coming up with the, the right certification that clearly addresses those pain points. And we certainly believe that if we're able to even change a small part of the industry and in improving and, and eliminating certain pain points, then we're gonna revolutionize the industry with this certification. So watch out for that. Uh, we're certainly working hard and we'll look at uh, getting that released next year to, uh, to all of our, our members and, and partners around the world. So exciting to hear about that, Ben. So finally, I would like to thank you all for sharing great and actionable insight around the engineering and construction industry from a global as well as regional perspective. It has been a true pleasure for me to moderate our panel discussion. I would like to thank a big five organizers for providing this opportunity for us and for the advancement of the profession. Thank you all. And welcome back, really looking at between skyscraping and the shifting sands. So much great content there in that panel. And Grace, a million thanks to you for moderating that, really. Big thanks, of course, to Ben and Engineer Issa and to uh, Dr. Mansour, but uh, thank you so much, Grace. Now, Dr. Mansour, unfortunately, His Excellency was called away for an urgent meeting, so we don't have him joining us for this discussion here, but with the q and I do have a great lineup here. And again, thank you all for staying with us. Engineer Issa, if I may ask you first, when we look at you know, implementing plans or indeed planning to implement any, particularly when we look at portfolio management and taking into consideration managing benefits and focusing on value, how do you actually look at that? Are you looking to implement portfolio management? Well, uh, maybe uh, I can give two big examples here, uh, which I think are very related to uh, to the industry and many people can understand from. The first one is the Road and Transport Authority in Dubai. Uh, one of the most successful, I would say, uh, portfolio management uh, the system that they have, it's, it's very well governed and it's very active and, and supportive across the different verticals of the organization. So in the Road and Transport Authority in Dubai, the, there are agencies in charge of the Metro line, agencies in charge of the uh, tramways, the uh, road and transport system, uh, bridges and, and tunnels, and many other uh, traffic signaling systems. They have to be working together in a coherent way and they have to manage the, I would say, the resources on an annual basis and respond to existing network and transport challenges in the city. So, I mean, a good and very strong uh, portfolio management 
you can see the reflection of that on the achievement and the results of the uh, road and transport uh, project that the RTA is doing. It's currently one of, I think, the best at this moment uh, in the region and worldwide in responding to transport and uh, mobility challenges in urban areas. So that doesn't come out of, I mean, just uh, just a basic project management. It definitely is backed by a very strong portfolio management and leadership on that level. The, the second example where we will see benefit management, I would say the Expo, because I was working myself on it. Uh, in 2015, when the uh, Office of Project Management to deliver the uh, Expo project was established, uh, the portfolio management wasn't just at the project level, but it was on a citywide level because there are multiple stakeholders, I would say road and transport system need to come around the Expo area to solicit and uh, allow a smooth journey of mobility towards the Expo. And as well as I would say uh, electricity system, it has to be 50% of which had to be from uh, renewable energy. The security system also had to uh, ensure uh, an easy and safe uh, mo uh, movement. Within the site itself, it's, it's a mega program and it has multiple portfolios. So we had three different portfolio levels, one on the government uh, level, one on the uh, program-wide level, and one specifically down because the Expo itself, it will have its project and other multiple third parties projects. How to co <laughs> work properly with that and ensure the ultimate result is achieved upon uh, finishing the Expo and beyond the legacy. So we always had the legacy in mind. It was not just Expo that will people enjoy the six months of, of celebrating and uh, seeing the exhibition, but also what the this place will be a living future sustainable city. So benefit management with a strong portfolio was the only reason to uh, the only way I would say to help us uh, achieve that uh, target. And indeed, the, the ultimate big project um, in place for all project managers out there when they look at Expo. Now, Ben Breen, you're the global head of construction, so I'm absolutely delighted you're here. So you can give us a bit of a bird's eye view. And you see it firsthand in terms of different countries, you know, not necessarily different regulations, but different ways of managing people, looking at projects, all of that. Talk to me about the changes perhaps you've seen, you know, over the years in terms of what project managers, who they need to be and the skills they now need. And I think you very eloquently delivered some of those for us. But just will you elaborate a little bit on that? Because it really has changed in recent years, hasn't it? Yes, thanks, Etna. It, it definitely has changed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was already changing uh, a lot of uh, things needed to change as a result of technological uh, you know, inputs that were impacting the way that we work. And certainly now with COVID that's come along, um, you know, there, there's definitely a risk right now that if you do not uh, upskill yourself, then you could be left behind. So, you know, definitely we think that there should be a big emphasis on making sure that you're, you're keeping up not only keeping up with the changes, but you're, you're looking ahead and trying to give yourself the right skills to give you the best chance to, to really thrive. Um, there was a, a recent report done by McKinsey, which really emphasised that and said, uh, you know, the, the companies who are upskilling their workforce now and were already in the process of doing it prior to, to COVID are the ones that have, have been very successful. So that, that's something that you know, we definitely see, the skills that I talked about earlier, uh, but there is quite a lot of other skills out there that it's a matter of looking specifically at, at you know, what components you're working on. Do you need to focus on things like technology or do you need to focus on just approving, sorry, improving efficiency in the way that you work? Uh, all of those things are something that uh, are, are very important to making sure that you can really future-proof yourself. And do you see that shift that, you know, is happening around the world, maybe at different degrees, of course, you know, but um, I suppose the speed of it as well, and if anything that COVID has taught us, I suppose, is the agility that we were all capable of, how innovative we actually can be. Um, I've talked to, to many senior people here, and it was almost like... Uh, putting a word out there not not to overthink things because 
when people were forced into a situation like this and had to react, uh, many, many companies were just amazed at how people were just kicked into gear and got the job done. So perhaps people will be rethinking the fact that they can maybe move with a little more speed and agility for the future. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that was actually, if you look at it globally, the way that people change to working from home and to, you know, working virtually was very commendable. Um, considering as well that there is still a lot of people in the world that that don't have strong, you know, internet connections or, or their own computer. But people, um, and if you look at even schools and things like that, they were very innovative. They came up with ways to enable you know, people to still go to school or to, to join online calls and make sure that uh, you know, building efficiencies remained. And in fact, I was talking to a, a big company here yesterday that they're still only at about 25% of their you know, global workforce back to the office. And they're already looking at how can they change their, their office structure and setup to you know, acknowledge the fact that right now people have worked from home and still been very efficient and there hasn't been a significant drop in whatever it is they're trying to achieve, whether it's you know, revenue or profitability or, or effectiveness. And so people yeah, that need to be commended for really being able to work together to create these communities in a virtual environment and support each other to make sure that they were able to be successful. I, I think that was wonderful. And uh, we may have to do it for a little while longer, I think, you know, so people are getting good at it. Engineer SF, yes, yes. I can come back to you. Um, a question that just came in here and um, somebody saying to us, I believe governments can learn a lot from the UAE, but also asking, how do you manage the integration between various organizations? Is it via centralization or implementing agile autonomous collaboration? What do you think is the best way in terms of organizations and how people work together within the UAE to deliver projects. I think you touched on some of it. Engineer Isa. Yeah, uh, actually we went from um, cooperation and interface to integration uh, model. In the past, uh, it was uh, a more a coordination approach between the different relevant stakeholders uh, locally in a city or in the, uh, on an intercity level across the nation. But now what I see is that we are moving towards more uh, an integration approach where we work collaboratively together uh, for one joint goal. We might have, uh, I mean, shared uh, systems uh, to, uh, to use. Uh, that is the, the, the ultimate. Uh, if we want to manage futuristic projects and uh, apply AI and artificial intelligence and all the innovative ones, it cannot happen with the uh, very basic and outdated uh, and classical way of managing things. And that is, I, I think, uh, a lesson our leaders have uh, been teaching us every day. If we see there is no one month that we see our prime minister and uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed is meeting at least twice or sometimes three times a month. Uh, and they, us as, as leaders also, we go to their mattresses and we see how they are very supportive to achieving the goals of the nations. This gives us an indication and also sometimes wisdom to understand that not everything uh, can be possible uh, just by, I mean, working in silos. Everything only works when we work in a more collaborative and joint effort approach. Indeed, and I think that's one of the key messages we're getting here at the Big Five Digital Festival right throughout the last four days here. And it's also that absolute commitment to actually working together. Um, ben, if we don't have a whole lot of time here, but I'd like to ask you a question here in terms of, it's a bit of a wide one. What do, uh, you know, what does PMI see as perhaps some of the key risks in the industry, you know, post COVID? I mean, what do we really need to be working on? What are we looking at? What's really important and perhaps top of the agenda, you know, when you look at this industry for the years to come? Yeah, I, I think it, it still relates to what I was talking about in terms of having the right skills. Um, you know, the the risks are, uh, you know, the, essentially people now need to be able to be so flexible and adaptable that if they don't, um, then, you know, the companies themselves will become redundant and there will be many companies that, that disappear. 
So they need to really sort of reinvent themselves to, to look at, question everything that they've been doing and saying, how can we potentially do that better? And really change the way that they're working in fundamental ways. And we talked about agility. Agile is not something that's mentioned very often in the construction industry. Uh, you know, it's still very much a traditional methodology for deliveries, but we do need to look at how we can bring elements of agility into it to, to be a lot more efficient and, and to get things done in, in shorter periods of time. Uh, I think that's certainly uh, one of the key things. And the, the other thing that I see as a risk is people burning out. Um, people who are working from home on calls at seven in the morning and then all the way through to 11 o'clock or midnight and separating the work and, and home um, lives and making sure that you are creating that, that separation so that you, uh, you know, that you keep your sanity essentially. That sort of sounds like me at the moment. So I'll take your good advice on that one. So I will. Um, Grace, just very quickly, I want to bring you in here. You know, when we look at, um, you know, continuous learning from uh, members of this profession to the importance of that too, in terms of, you know, upskilling and, and, and looking beyond just the, the technical skills too. How important is that, do you think? So I think PMI has highlighted this importance in all our research. And we have demonstrated like uh, the risk of the poor performance correlates directly to the outcome. And uh, it also uh, uh, impacted negatively the ROI. So I think there is an imperative need for upskilling and it's no longer optional for organization not to invest in their talent, talent at, at the heart. And what's uh, really important is that the mix of talent is important. We have highlighted previously the talent triangle, the importance of technical skills, business skills, but we're now building and mapping these to more uh, having project manager become change makers. And we all know, and I think my panelists have already highlighted that for every construction project, there are changes. We're looking, we're looking into a railway system or a, or a tower in order not only to deliver a project, but to improve the social economical aspects to have instead of having city, we ha we're looking into a smart city. So now as even the transformation into the construction we need people not only to look at deliverables, but to look at the benefits. And I think there is a question around portfolio. I think the importance in projects, when project managers deal with projects, they need to look at it from an investment perspective, from a strategic management and benefit management perspective. And this is what PMI is trying to elevate, the understanding of strategy, strategic management and the change makers behind every project management. That the skills we're looking at the mix of these technical leadership, strategic skills, and above all of these digital skills as well. So this is the whole, yes. that is and our the future too. forward thinking. And it is, it's about building sustainable leaders as well as general sustainability. Um, Engineer Issa, I'm gonna leave you a final word on this. Talk to me a little bit about local construction using the local supply chain and maybe local supplies and how that can actually help too in terms of sustainability. Oh, well, there are many things actually. If you look at the, uh, I mean, UAE was a desert. We, we turned that desert into buildings, for example. If you look at the Northern Emirates, uh, Ras al-Khaimah and uh, Fujairah, mountainous areas, they have great materials for uh, for cement, uh, for aggregates, cement. Uh, and if we look at the, uh, the Palm Island, uh, I think back then I was in last year of school. So I did the research and I was seeing all the rocks are coming from Ras al-Khaimah. So those uh, are... Uh, sustainably developed with, with local materials. Um, moving forward, uh, the UAE is currently building its uh, rail network. So when I was in a had rail uh, nine or 10 years ago, the vision was to, to create a sustainable economy and sustainable environment. We need to move to more sustainable modes of transport such as railway, and uh, by which at least uh, Eighty percent of the fuel which is consumed by classical truck system to move aggregate cement and whatsoever is going to be reduced by eighty percent when we move to a railway, for example. And not only that, now one of the top three verticals for the railway is to move those aggregate stands and cement material from Northern Emirates all the way to Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and probably to the GCC through the, uh, the network. By itself, you, you, 
you're bringing local material to to develop it with sustainable mindset yet the mode of transport itself is as sustainable so uh probably 15 years ago the word sustainability was new topic uh, was hot topic there we see it it's uh, business as usual and it becomes the normal the new normal uh, and i hope as uh, grace said in the future becomes the better normal and we think more sustainably with other materials i see some practices happening these days with i mean uh, innovation uh, related to materials but i think we need to put more effort there uh, there should be more efforts on on uh, improving the material and make it more efficient and use it in a better way as well absolutely um engineer i said thank you so much and we're going to have to wrap it up there but um I think we are um, around the region here. We look at building sustainability into it. And I think some great examples and thank you for sharing. So um, it was great that we had His Excellency Dr. Mansour join us earlier. Um, Engineer Asa, thank you so much. Ben Breen, great to have you on board. And I know all of the uh, project management professionals out there, we've had some great comments. They really appreciated you being on board. And once again, thank you to Grace Najjar for moderating that panel. Thank you all.